You know, there's plenty of negative press levy that the technology industry these days. It's one of the few things both sides of the aisle agree on. Accusations like privacy invaders, fake news amplifiers, job destroyers, discriminators, and more are commonly thrown at technology companies. You know, look, it's understandable. A lot of people are struggling, but the stock market's booming, in large part thanks to the tech industry, which creates massive wealth for a relatively select group of people. But lately, there's little recognition for the substantial value that tech companies have delivered over the decades. And for those of us growing up in Massachusetts, for most of the tech industry's history, people have had a favorable view of technology and its impact on the economy here. Helped America defeat Japan in the computing business. The internet has had very positive impact on our lives. And technology has been the heart of American exceptionalism. And moreover, many tech entrepreneurs who have benefited financially are passionate about giving back and applying their talents to solve real hard problems. For example, after accidents, cancer is the number one cause of death among young people. In the 1950s, the survival rate for kids with cancer was around 55%. Today, that survival rate is above 85% for kids between the ages of one and 14. Tech Tackles Cancer is entering its 10th year, and one of the people here in Mass using his talents, his ample energy, his network, and his largesse to attack the kids with cancer problem is my friend, Chris Lynch, CEO, entrepreneur, investor, philanthropist. Chris, welcome back to theCUBE. CPL's in the house. Great to see you, man. Great to see you, and thanks for having me, Dave. That, always a pleasure. 10 years of Tech Tackles Cancer, but first of all, congratulations. But it started even before that with Shaving the Heads and St. Baldrick's. You, take us back to that point, and how did you decide to transition to TTC? Sure, so as you know, we started Tech Tackles Cancer and started fundraising for pediatric cancer, actually, because we lost a colleague's son, and that's what sort of got us involved and, and made us aware. I had no idea that pediatric cancer was different than you know, cancer that adults get and the research is different, et cetera. And um, that's how we got involved with St. Baldrick's originally. Our first event was a head shaving at Dylan's Pub in town. And um, you know, we began to grow from that, but we found that while we had plenty of uh, women barbers, not a lot of participants, direct participants, um, you know, people that, women that were up for getting their head shaved and we wanted to be more inclusive in what we were trying to do in the tech community. So we migrated to playing these, you know, rock and roll rumble shows and soliciting, you know, executives from life science and technology primarily to come sing and get supported to raise money for pediatric cancer awareness and funding. Okay, you also have offshoots. There's like a, there's like a tree, like a coaching tree in football, but but you've got this Beat It program. T tell us about that. Sure. My youngest son, uh, Chris Lynch Jr., Junior Lynch, has been performing with us since we transitioned from head shaving to the rock and roll shows. And uh, he's been performing since he was eight. He's now 18. And um, inspired by Joey Kramer's involvement last year, the Hall of Fame drummer from Aerosmith, he was thinking about how he could use his music talents to contribute in a different way, and he came up with this program, Beat It, which is basically music therapy, leveraging drumming and percussion, and he's delivering that to the hospitals, to the patients, to get them to work with music as a form of therapy, as a form of you know, exercise and sort of you know, inspiration to you know, give them a distraction off of what is a, you know, a very tough battle. And, um, He'll be performing, and he's actually recording a song, a Beatles song, tomorrow night uh, with Tony Severino at his studio, which will be, will be offered as a download to support his program. But the idea is to get sponsorship from instrument companies that will provide in-kind equipment to the hospitals, and he's starting a YouTube channel as well as in-person visits to work with the kids and teaching them the basics of, you know, drumming and music and, you know, doing that as a form of music therapy and his way of contributing to Tech Tackles Cancer. I love it. And maybe a little Keith Moon action. You know, they, they better get some sponsors to replace those drums when they put their foot through them. Um, let's bring up the first slide, if you guys will, because I want to talk about the format here. Um, so it's November 7th uh, uh, at the Sinclair in Cambridge. 
And you can see here uh, some of the, the singers that we got here. Chris Lynch, of course, from At Scale. Patrick Osborne's amazing. He's gonna, I'm sure he's going to bring his sax, right? Patrick's uh, incredible. John uh, Procaccini from Tech Systems. Matt Smith from Receptor. Lily McIntyre won it last year. She's from Wasabi. And then Jax from EXP Realty. And you can see the, the sponsors, At Scale, Gaia Group, Login VSI, MC2AI, Receptor, Wells Fargo, Advisors, Wasabi, Veracode, Snowplow, SCS Financials, also Deep Vibe, and of course, The Cube, Chris. Unbelievable. Talk about the format, because it's, it's just incredible. When you first told me about this, I said, oh, live karaoke, but it's, it's more than that. You got live bands, and your, people are singing. I guess they can have you know, some assist, but I mean, they practice, they rehearse, yeah. there's a little competition. It's, tell us more about it. Sure. So. Um, you could go and do karaoke anywhere. Um, this is your rock star for a night. So you've got to perform with a professional band. You've got to rehearse. You've got to know the words. You have to be able to get up and sing in front of 500 people. So um, it's an opportunity to do something that I think is for a lot of people once in a lifetime and very unique. So I differentiate it from karaoke in that respect. And the other is I, I liken it more to like when we we're growing up, the WBCN Rock and Roll Rumbles. Yeah, I right. call it the Rock and Soul Rumble because we're broader than just rock. You know, people will come and they'll play, you know, all kinds of music, but it, it's definitely a competition. And um, I think it brings out the creative juices and the competitive juices of fire that, you know, makes our business what it is. Um, and I think it inspires people to build the muscle memory around giving. Uh, which I think is important. And from my perspective, and you do a lot of trade shows and, and events for the tech community, I think that from my perspective, people should sponsor Tech Tackles Cancer because pediatric cancer is an important problem to solve. Um, but beyond that, it's from my perspective, if, it doesn't, if you don't have a philanthropic budget because you're a startup like AtScale, take it out of your marketing and events budget because you're going to meet potential customers, you're going to meet potential employees, you're going to meet potential partners that you'll start your next company with, you're going to meet venture capitalists and angel investors that are investing in those companies. So from my perspective, you know, it's about community, it's about solving an important problem, but it's about understanding how you can do that in the same motion of your daily business activities and make all those things better. It's a great networking event. Um, I, was, I was there two years ago. I wasn't there last year because I was traveling, but the Cube is going to be there documenting it. And then bring up the next slide. I just want to give you a taste because it is competitive. And this is what you're in for, right? I mean, Chris Lynch is serious. I don't know how you lost last year, bro, with this, you know, you got, you got a, you're cut. Are you still that cut? Yeah, the problem is <laughs> then I have to sing. <laughs> well, you, actually, I was very impressed. You know, I got to tell you, Steve Duplessis, did it. He sang Mustang Sally. He was fantastic. Uh, Ken Steinhardt got up there. Ain't talking about love. My love is rotten to the core. He was doing Van Halen. That's and it's right. just really high quality music. And as I said, Patrick Osborne, I've been down in New Orleans with him. He walks into a bar and starts playing. He's, he's that good. Uh, George Hope has been there and you, you got, you know, tremendous support. So definitely encourage you to go networking. Like Chris said, you're going to meet a lot of people there. There's, there's prospective employees. There's, there's, there's capital allocators there. I mean, it's a fantastic networking event and, and, a, and a great cause. So um, before we go, I, I want to ask you about what's happening in the market today, because you, sure. um, you have been a capital allocator. You're, you're really, you're in it for the sport, I always say. You're an entrepreneur at heart, CEO, You've, you've, you've built companies, you know how difficult uh, that is. What are you making of this AI wave? Um, everybody's talking about it, of course. A lot of people are concerned that the customers aren't getting the ROI. Uh, we, you know, we're seeing a little bit of a backlash on that, although you know, the semiconductor guys like NVIDIA are still, still cranking away. What do you make of this? I mean, you've seen a lot of these waves in the past. W what do you think this one is gonna, gonna ultimately show us? Well, I think ultimately it'll eclipse the internet and the industrial revolution and the impact that it can have on the world, which is the exciting, exciting thing. Um, but I think like if you think of any of those cycles, you know, the difference is the compression of time, how long it took for the industrial revolution to happen, how long it took for the internet to commercially develop, right? And if you think about those two things and think about what's happened in the last 
18, 24 months, right? So effectively in 24 months, we've had a sea change that is of the caliber of those other two. Um, that said, we're in super early days in the, in the hype mode of how it'll be used. Um, and obviously we've seen the enemy, it's us. So the technology has, you know, incredible promise to change the world in a positive way or in a negative way. And that's gonna be determined by what we do um, and the maturity and how we develop the technology and decide how to absorb it. So I think the challenge is sort of getting our sea legs and moving forward in small choppy steps versus, you know, trying to change the world in one stroke. I don't think that's gonna happen, but I, but I think that um, looking at real business problems we can so solve. I'm much more interested early days in applied BI, right? And applied AI, you know, generative BI. How are we gonna take business data and apply it to solve business problems? How are we gonna solve, you know, use medical data to solve medical problems, specific use cases and problems? And I think that's where you grow confidence and capability. Um, think about how long it took for us to really start working with machine learning, right? And going from analysis to prediction. So, you know, I think the, you know, the sky's the limit, you know, but it's going to, it's going to require a lot of thought and patience into how we apply the technology, you know, to do so responsibly. As, as an investor, what do you make of the massive capital expense that's required to train these LLMs. I mean, <clears throat> obviously you see OpenAI, its valuation keeps growing. I think they just raised or are about to raise 6 billion at a, another massive valuation, um, well north of 100 billion now. <clears throat> but the business model is really unclear. At the same time, software has always been a you know, capital efficient business, although it looks like these LLM vendors really are not capital efficient, they're, they're almost capital inefficient. The bigger these models get, the more capex they have to spend. But then at the other end of the spectrum, do you think you can actually start companies now with way fewer people and actually, you know, four people can do what 40 used to be able to do. What do you make of that sort of barbell? Yeah, so, so I, I look at the current um, market for artificial intelligence and I view it like any technology initiative, it's R&D and I think we're in the research phase. And in the research phase is, you know, there is no business model per se, and if you needed a, business, a confirmed business model to invest in the research, you'd never invest in the research. Mm -hmm. So I applaud those that are courageously investing in AI research, but I think that's what they're investing in. As a capitalist, a, you know, a 62-year-old capitalist that, you know, probably isn't gonna live to 162, but, you know, God willing, my kids might, right, with the advances in mental technology. I'm leaving the research to the Amazons and the Apples of the world, right? And I'm involved in investing in companies that are developing solutions based on that research. And I think we're at the research phase of a lot of these initiatives in artificial intelligence. It won't be monetized anytime soon, and it'll only be monetized when we we can move to the phase of development and then ultimately application. Application is where the money is, right? But there's no visibility into those applications without real applied BI and applied AI development. So I see it in three buckets. You know, in the first bucket is massive spending to create the platforms to do the other two things, but it's a necessary requirement. If you think about the basic research that happened in anything, sending somebody to the moon, right? People, you know, for a long time said, well, geez, we can't feed people in the streets, but we're investing in sending someone to the moon. Well, the fact of the matter is the research that was done in sending somebody to the moon created so many products, right, that we use today. Radar, nuclear power, you know, um, probably certain uh, uh, food preservative you know, uh, uh, techniques. Um, yeah. it's, all, it's the, all the stuff that we're being yeah. told now not to eat. Yes, yeah, right. It's created, right? <laughs> but so, so it's a necessary evil. Um, so it's something that you can't measure on mature business dynamics, right? 
I don't think there's a, there's a short-term ROI. There's a long-term massive ROI, right? There's a sea change. Um, so I think it would be a mistake to evaluate investment in AI research, you know, on the same measurement of, you know, a Wall Street company, for instance. Right. So I think that I'm not daunted by looking at the, the level of investment required because I absolutely believe that um, the payoff in those applications will be there, right? Now, to answer your, your direct question, you know, am I, am I gonna you know, cut the at-scale workforce by 50% and have AI bots you know, selling the software and answering the you know, customer? You know, no, no time soon. Do, do I think that is part of the future? Sure. Um, but at the end of the day, artificial intelligence is just that, right? So human intelligence fuels artificial intelligence. So I think it's about scaling people. It's about giving people platforms to be more creative, to use more dimensions of who they are, that ultimately will be executed at the machine level. So I want to ask you about um, M&A. I've been, I've been I, every week I rant about Lena Khan, Khan and how she's you know, killing M&A and attacking big tech. Some of the stuff she's doing is, is maybe okay. But there's clearly an impact on venture capital. If you can't sell to these big companies, if Amazon and Google and Meta and, and Apple are not allowed and Microsoft to acquire companies, well that just dries up one source of, of exit for these, these venture investors, which are driving so much innovation. There's no IPO market right now, eventually that'll come back. Um, the, the, the DPIs are under pressure um, and taking longer and longer and longer to get to, to exit. So maybe these are just cycles. You've seen a lot of them. What do you, what do you make of that? Is, is, is this current administration doing damage to American exceptionalism? Uh, do you feel like it'll eventually flip back the other way? Is it going to cause us to be less competitive as a nation? What are your thoughts on all that? So, so I, a few things. So I think, um, so the answer is yes. It, it's, it's, to me, it's, um, it's creating friction in a market that's got plenty of friction that you know, should be getting support from the government because to me, technology, AI, like it, it's, it's a more contemporary version of, you know, nuclear research, right? Right. Like at the end of the day, it's not going to be boots on the ground. It's going to be fingers on the keyboard. We're seeing that, right? So I think, you know, our, our um, legal system, our immigration system, um, our commerce system are all well behind. I mean, if you look at every facet of the United States government, they're living in the dark ages versus where technology is today. So the problem is the people that are instrumenting the rules have no idea what they're talking about. None. And that's scary thinking that, you know, they don't have experts that really understand the technology and understand the technology landscape. So we're competing globally with countries that, you know, not only are, are stealing our stuff, right, but they're galvanizing their entire countries to do so. Yeah, and they're getting funded by the government by the in government a big way. to do that, right? And we, we have a government that's getting in the way. Think about what you just said. Who's going to be able to afford, right, companies in the United States, right, to do that research that doesn't have a 90-day pay payback or a 12-month payback, right? That's over the next several decades. We're playing small ball, right? So at the end of the day, if it, if it requires consolidation, right, or government support, Right, we spend enough money on ridiculous things. Imagine investing, right, in our people to train them. You know, forget about college. Who knows if co college may be obsolete? But training people to function and look at technology as a vocation, not just an education. It's both, and we could be leveraging that and leveraging the power and the lead that we have. But unfortunately, we're falling down at you know at every you know, at every level. We're making it difficult for the, the people who really understand the technology and could be leading to get into the country to collaborate, right, with the 50 years of experience that exists in the United States. Well, and I think <clears throat> my rant is always, it seems like 
the government, and particularly the FTC and the DOJ, feel like, well, this, we're trying to preserve competition. You're in this business. I mean, I've been observing this business for decades. This is, this is like the most competitive business I've ever seen. Like Amazon and Google and Microsoft don't compete with each other, and Meta now getting into the, into the game. And if you look at you know, these waves, hey, we've- Excuse me one second. Yeah. I'll give you a better example, right? That's contemporary for us, Cisco, yeah. right? I was a Wellflesian, right? I worked for the other guys, right? Ultimately, there was all this, well, well, we have basically one router company. Most valuable company on the planet right. in 1999, 2000. Right, and now it's got competition. It's, in, it's been forced to get into all kinds of other businesses, right? And everyone's gotten to their business and the whole thing's blurred. The challenge is you, you have regulators that don't understand technology, don't understand the technology landscape. So they don't understand that these things, right, are, are living organisms and they can, right, clot together, they can separate, and the market determines that. The market forces that. The rate of innovation forces that. And they're artificially trying to put rules in place that are handcuffing U.S. companies from competing in a global market and for the United States to compete in a global market. You know what's bizarre to me, Chris, is when you think about that, I agree with you, by the way. I think the government is just misguided. If you think about the waves, like if, if the hyperscalers are the dominant companies today, which they are, but it's right in front of us what the new wave is going to bring. NVIDIA, Tesla, BYD, China, you know, TSM. Nobody even talked about TSM, you know, in last decade. Now they're like the most important company in the world in terms of semiconductor manufacturing. None of these names were even mentioned in the previous sort of cloud era, and, and, and there are others that are going to dominate, right? See, it's right in front of our eyes, yet the government now wants to come in and regulate. I'm not saying they shouldn't like, pay attention to when a company's breaking the law, they should. But maybe narrow remedies, but they're talking about breaking up Google. They're talking about you know, all these very broad-based remedies. It can be like AT&T all over again. We're going to lose Bell Labs. Bell Labs owned by Nokia. Bell Labs is, you remember Bell Labs. I do. They were like the crown jewel of uh, American innovation. And so, anyway, thank you for your opinions on that. Anything else you want to share I want, before we wrap? Um, last thing I, I forgot to mention, one of our sponsors, Joey Kramer has a, a coffee company called Rockin' and Roasting Coffee. Yes. They're going to be there. And um, if you see me, grab me and I'll buy you an espresso martini. <laughs> I love it. All right, bring, bring up, Kent, bring up that last slide if you would. So we'll, we'll close here. Really appreciate your support. There's a lot of ways you can support, as Chris was saying. You can go to this URL, you can buy tickets, you can donate, you can volunteer, you can, if you can sing, even if you can't sing, get up there and have some fun. Um, so many ways uh, to participate. Chris, we'll, we'll give you the last word. Or sponsor, we're still looking for corporate sponsors. It's a great branding opportunity. It's a great business opportunity. And don't worry about singing. I can't sing, that doesn't stop me. It shouldn't stop you. If you can raise money, get on the stage. All right, Tech Tackles Cancer, November 7th in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the Sinclair. Check it out, uh, it's right in the heart of Harvard Square. Tech tackles cancer, be there with theCUBE. Thanks for watching everybody, and we'll see you next time.